Good afternoon and good morning to everyone watching from Germany and the United States. My name is Andrea Rotter and I'm heading the Foreign and Security Policy Division at the Hans Seidel Foundation in Munich. It is my great pleasure to welcome you to our seventh session of our virtual event series called Road to Election Night and Beyond. As most of you know, the Road to Election Night and Beyond is a joint venture of now 12 leading transatlantic institutions think tanks and political foundations, which was designed to foster transatlantic dialogue between decision makers, think tank experts, media representatives, and civil society. First of all, I would like to thank um, all our partners for the great and constructive cooperation in these very difficult times. And my special thanks go to the Yespen Institute and their team who really carry out the bulk of the work and make this great series possible. I'm very thrilled to be moderating today's discussion on safeguarding transatlantic security, a, D a new deal for European American relations question mark. And I couldn't think of anyone better suited to discuss the implications of Joe Biden's election victory on transatlantic security relation than with our two speakers of today. On the one side, I would like to welcome Heather Conley. She is the si Senior Vice President for Europe, Eurasia and the Arctic and the Director of the Europe Program at CSIS, the renowned Center for Strategic and International Studies in Washington, DC. She began her career in the Bureau of Political Military Affairs at the US State Department, and since then held several high-ranking positions, like the Special Assistant to the Coordinator of US Assistance to the newly independent states of the former Soviet Union, and Deputy Assistant Secretary of State in the Bureau of European and Eurasian Affairs with responsibilities for US bilateral relations with countries of Northern and Central Europe. Heather, thank you for being with us today. Thank you, it's wonderful to be with you. On the other side, I'm very grateful that we'll be joined by Thomas Silberhorn, who is currently serving as Parliamentary State Secretary at the German Federal Ministry of Defense. In this position, Thomas Silberhorn assists the Federal Minister of Defense in the parliamentary and political representation of the interests of the Directorate General concerned with equipment, including such important issues like international armament policies, planning, budget, and controlling. As a member of the German Bundestag since 2002, Thomas Silberhorn has actively shaped German foreign policy in various ways, most notably as the Parliamentary State Secretary at the German Federal Ministry for Economic Cooperation and Development before joining the Federal Ministry of Defense. Mr. Silberhorn, thanks for joining us today. Good evening, it's a pleasure. Okay, thanks. So before we start the discussion, a few organizational remarks. After about 30 minutes of moderated discussion, um, we want to give our audience the chance to join the debate. While there won't be time to answer all of, our, of your questions, um, we'll do our very best, I promise. You will be able to participate either via the Q&A function in the comment section or raise the, or use the raise hand button um, for live audio questions. So keep your questions ready um, to, to join our debate. Okay, so let's get started. I'm sure our topic doesn't need lots of introduction as most people in our audience know. Um, that there were recent tensions and conflicts within the Atlantic Alliance. Um, it would be certainly too easy and far too short-sighted to blame all problems of the Atlantic Alliance on Donald Trump alone. Um, but I think it is very safe to say that Donald Trump's policy of America first and his personal style added a great deal of uncertainty with, into the alliance as NATO partners were left wondering whether they could rely on the United States or not. And I'm sure that there was a collective sigh of relief from European capitals could, um, heard in DC when Joe Biden was projected winner of the 2020 presidential election. So Heather, let's start with what to expect from the incoming Biden administration with regard to NATO and transatlantic security. So what will be the priorities of the new incoming administration and what most importantly for European viewers will he expect of European allies? 
Well, Andrea, thank you so much. Uh, yes, I know the world uh, was holding its breath. Uh, so many colleagues were sending us notes before on the day of the November 3rd election. Good luck, we're pulling for you. I mean, I think that even that very personal reflection tells you that uh, you know these, these relationships are extremely strong and deep. I think what we have in President-elect Biden is really the first foreign policy American president since uh, President George H.W. Bush. Uh, this is someone who uh, 30 years on the Senate Foreign Relations Committee has traveled wide and far, knows leaders, knows issues, and certainly as vice president did carry a great deal of weight in the foreign policy portfolio. So you have someone who uh, knows these issues. There's not a learning curve, uh, obviously uh, updating. And, and we hope that this transition period begins so the vice president can get those national security briefings that we can stop the delay and get this transition moving because we need every American president, whether they are Republican or Democratic to be successful. So we're hoping that uh, is the case. So I, I think again, just just to in some ways reiterate what uh, the president-elect has already told us. His agenda is obviously uh, focusing on the pandemic and getting that under control and then working on the economics of trying to get greater stability in the American economy and of course the global economy, not unlike what Chancellor Merkel is describing uh, for Germany, what the European Union is working on as well. But in the foreign policy agenda, clearly, the president-elect has uh, put at the center of his foreign and security policy allies, uh, where the last four years has been an experiment in not only the United States trying to meet the challenges of, of adversaries, but then trying to be combative with its allies at the same time. And we've seen uh, that the results of that uh, you know, work against US interests. So this is going to be an allied-centric approach. Um, and I think, the, so that's the good news, and, and certainly Europe is going to benefit from a president who knows them well, knows the issues well, and is looking for engagement. You'll see restoration, return to the Paris Climate Agreement, return to the WHO. Um, and I think you're going to see very quickly the first decision that has to happen in the, within the first two weeks of a Biden administration is extension of the New START Treaty, the US-Russian Arms Control Treaty. So that's going to immediately put us into an allied uh, transatlantic approach. Troop withdrawals, the, the Biden administration is going to have to decide whether they're going to carry through with the troop withdrawal announcements that President uh, Trump certainly just yesterday on Afghanistan and Iraq, uh, and of course earlier on the Germany uh, troop withdrawal. So there's going to be some immediate decisions for sure, um, but I think the first, you know, the first phone calls, the first visits will be reestablishing for the United States that our allies are America's greatest strength, but we have to have a new approach to those allies, and I know we'll get into that conversation a bit later, but thank you. Okay, thank you. So um, this sounds very promising, at least from a European point of view. Um, so Mr. Silberhorn, um, for the last four years, especially Germany has been the focus of lots of criticism coming from the Trump administration, be it military spending and the 2% goal, be it Nord Stream 2, for example. And just yesterday, German Minister of Defense, Annegret kamp karrenbauer called for a new transatlantic deal, as if she knew that we were gonna that we're going to have this conversation um, today, right? Um, so, what are Germany's expectations of the new incoming American um, administration, and more importantly, what can Germany offer um, in terms of a new transatlantic deal? Um, thank you very much, and thanks for for supporting this conference from so many think tanks. I think um, that um, the most significant change might be in the tonality. So there is some expectations, indeed, that uh, Germany and European allies uh, will be seen primarily as partners. Uh, yes, we are competitors to some extent, but. Um, at first sight, we stand at the same side. I think this is very crucial to be stated and to be seen. Um, but in substance, my expectations are not too high because there is a bipartisan consensus in the United States in fundamental issues of foreign and security policy. This, for example, uh, is the case uh, in uh, the question of nuclear deterrence 
or in uh, the question of defense spending. So there will not be dramatic shifts because the perception of, uh, of the decisive actors, both in the Republican and Democratic Party, um, form a consensus in, these, in this regard. And I think there is also a clarity about uh, the role of the United States and uh, of the Europe, or European pillar of uh, NATO uh, correspondingly. And uh, so we have to, to realize that we will be confronted with uh, constant high expectations from the United States of America. And I, as I experienced it uh, during my last visit in Washington in the end of uh, July, uh, the wording uh, towards Germany uh, has been a bit uh, well, harder than to other European uh, countries because we are seen as the biggest and the economically uh, strongest country in Europe. Uh, so we, uh, we are expected to deliver because uh, the concern in Washington is if the Germans do not deliver, others might uh, do less. Um, and that's why indeed we have to do some homework in our national defense policy. Uh, we did already a lot uh, according to uh, the decisions made in Wales in 2014. So our defense budget, for example, has been increased by nearly 50% since 2014. But it's not only a question of uh, numbers and uh, money, it's in fact a question of military capabilities. We have to do more as Europeans, as Germans, in a sense, that we take a fair share of our coordinated and joint military capabilities within NATO. And the stronger we can get as European pillar of NATO, the stronger our transatlantic community as a whole will be. But I see uh, Joe Biden indeed as an expert in foreign and security policy for years and decades already. He has been to the Munich Security Conference, for example, and I suppose uh, he has already got uh, the invitation to the next Munich Security Conference. It will be shortly after the inauguration on 20th uh, January. We'll see how things go on with the, the corona situation in Germany, but hopefully there will be, uh, on, on, at a smaller scale, uh, um, um, a security conference in Munich that offers the opportunity uh, to present some uh, statements from the United States here in Germany and in, in Europe. And of course, there is a lot to do to keep and to strengthen the coherence, the cohesion within NATO, in particular uh, in, the, in the European uh, part of NATO. And I think this is also uh, very important for us that we want to and have to contribute to a better cohesion. Uh, we have to clarify some essential questions among European NATO allies in order to be more relevant for our transatlantic partners. And one step in this direction is uh, the offer or the succession of a new deal. Years ago, we failed to conclude the transatlantic trade and investment partnership and we can now see the harsh consequences of this. So I think there is an opportunity to do more in trade and investment and to make clear that uh, beyond our um, very concrete issues in defense and security policy, there are some basic questions of competition among the Western community and uh, China and rising autocratic countries. So is it uh, liberal democracy, human rights, protection of minorities that counts, or is it more autocratic organization uh, at the cost of individual freedom? And I think we are stronger in this regard than the corona pandemic um, on the one side shows uh, the challenge, but offers also the opportunity to showcase what this means in concrete terms. So we have to deliver. We have to do more, and uh, we are open for frank discussions among NATO partners. And um, in our um, in, in our understanding, NATO remains the cornerstone of our security here in Europe and in Germany.
Okay, thank you. So both of you already mentioned many important topics for the future of transatlantic security. And one thing which brings me to our next question, um, which already Thomas Silberhorn alluded to is a cohesion within the alliance, but most importantly, also a consensus within the European pillar or within European, uh, with, among European allies. Um, so what really um, was not really shocking to me, but once again, uh, was interesting to see that as everyone around the world and in Europe was waiting um, for the election results following November 3rd, the issue of Europe's strategic autonomy, autonomy came to the forefront of the um, debate and most notably um, led to a public disagreement between um, French President Emmanuel Macron on the one side and the German Minister of Defense on the other side. And while um, Ms. Kram Karampawa stated that Europe remains dependent on US military protection for decades to come, and that, quote, illusions of European strategic autonomy must come to an end, unquote, uh, President Macron, in a recent interview, uh, disagreed with the notion of European dependence, calling it a quote, historical misinterpretation, unquote, and doubled down on his call for European sovereignty. So Heather, what do you make of this? How does how is the debate within the European Union or within Europe seen from a Washington point of view? And what does the United States um, prefer? Amer French activism or German reticence, some, some might say? Well, thank you so much. I mean, I think just pulling back for a moment, I think what the last four years has, has meant for Europe is really rethinking whether it is in its best interest to remain uh, deeply entangled and engaged with the United States and sort of a broader Western coalition. In fact, I think uh, last year's uh, title of the Munich Security Conference, the Westlessness, was already speaking to that question of, is this the right place? And, and there are some, and certainly um, President Macron and, and thinker, thinker, French thinkers are saying, look, the only way for Europe to be able to preserve uh, European values and, and approaches is that we have to become our own separate entity to, to be able to be competitive against China's economic dominance and, and Russia's security challenges and, and the unpredictability of the United States and its unilateralism, Europe must be its own separate core uh, to be able to manage this. And in some ways, that separateness has sort of been translated, although strategic, the concept of strategic autonomy came well before uh, the, the arrival of, of President Trump and a new US president. These are the feelings that have been moving forward. Um, I, to me, I understand the emotional response to this. Uh, I, and certainly uh, the, the US approach to allies has been extremely challenging. But I would say that this is a mistake to consider uh, Europe being a separate entity, uh, trying to defend itself from all of these issues. If in, in fact, what we need to do, and maybe this is a new transatlantic deal, but that deal has to be fit for purpose for the 21st century. It can't be backward looking at all, that we have to think about how we work together on these great challenges using our, our strengths to manage the, manage the challenges we see, whether that's China, whether that's Russia, whether that's Iran, whether that's North Korea, whether that's climate, I mean, migration, you can name all of those. Uh, so if Europe believes it's in its best interest to be separate from the United States to manage this, that's a strategic loss for the United States. And I don't think Europe will be successful. What I think we need to do is come together to understand how we're going to use our strengths to manage these challenges. The state secretary mentioned the economic. Yes, the United States and the European Union are, are, are competitors. Uh, we do compete, but we also represent the largest uh, economic bloc if we wish to join forces. And what we saw over the last few days with the Chinese-led uh, regional uh, economic bloc we have already lost an enormous amount of time fighting over issues that aren't going to be uh, allow us to be successful in the 21st century. So we have enormous work to be done, but I don't believe that's for Europe to separate itself out. I think that's for the West 
the United States, the European Union, Japan, Australia, this reconceptualization of democrat democracies that have enormous interests and stakes at ensuring that Western rules, norms, values remain the, the, the guiding force for our economies and for conflicts and security, that's under threat right now. But doing it separately is gonna make us weaker, doing it together will make us stronger. Um, thank you. So, Mr. Zibohorn, um, when I stand, understand Heather correctly, of course, um, she would be more, or Washington, the United States, would be more in line with um, Germany's approach towards European autonomy, towards European um, capabilities or building up military capabilities. But still, there is a gap within the European Union. And so my question to you would be, how do you think we can bridge this gap um, and reach consensus within Europe? Because this gap, predominantly between France and Germany, for example, it will likely also affect transatlantic relations and our security cooperation in the future. Yeah, thank you. I'm not sure whether there is a gap in substance, but obviously there is a gap in our wording. Uh, if we have a look at European debates for years already, we often see that um, specific words are dropped, uh, whether it's strategic autonomy or European sovereignty or federal state of Europe or whatsoever. So there are political visions that are, that are not um, Underlay, underlied by, by political substance. And I think the core message of my minister was not only to European, but also to the German audience, it's no use to draw bright political visions on Sundays, but not to deliver on Mondays. This is the gap we have to bridge. Uh, we have a consensus, I think, in Europe that we have to do more in our own security and uh, defense policy. We have to gain more ability to act as Europeans, in particular within the European Union. Um, and the, the better we succeed in doing so, the more relevant we will be as NATO allies. Um, but beyond this, I think we have to gain a global perspective on threats and challenges we are confronted with. Because this internal European debate between visions on Sundays and not delivering on Mondays um, does not, uh, shall not neglect the necessity of gaining such a global approach to global challenges. And uh, this should enable us in Europe to get some understanding why China's rise is such a fundamental question for the United States. Uh, China is a competitor not only under economic and financial, but also under military aspects. And in substance, it's the question whether uh, liberal democracy is the way to proceed and to resolve our global challenges, or autocratic governments are more successful. And in this regard, I think it's very clear, we as Germans, as Europeans, will stand at the side of the United States in this regard. We strive for liberal democracy, for individual freedom, for human rights. And that's why NATO has to become a bit more political in this regard. We have to emphasize more our fundamental uh, shared political values. And on this basis, it's important to see Yes, we as Europeans and Germans have to do more of our homework. We cannot exclusively rely on the United States to do our job. And the, the Americans are right to expect from us to deliver more for our own security 75 years after the end of the Second World War. Uh, I remember the discussions we have in, in the German Bundestag from year to year. Uh, uh, whether we uh, uh, extend our mandates in Afghanistan or in Kosovo, where we are present for 20 years with our troops. The United States are present in Germany and in Europe for 75 years. Of course, there is a need for Germans and Europeans uh, to do more of our homework. And this does not only mean 
stability and security in Germany within uh, the European pillar of NATO. It uh, means also to uh, export some of our stability to our neighboring regions in the Western Balkans, in the Middle East, in Northern Africa. And in this regard, Germany does already a lot. We are present, for example, in the Baltic countries with air policing, with enhanced forward presence. So we are present on a permanent basis with the training of land forces, but also with air forces. Um, we have uh, a range of uh, multilateral and bilateral uh, corporations where uh, we can showcase that we do not only um, contribute by, by cash, but also by military capabilities and in joint mandates. And this is what we have to do in Europe. And on this basis, indeed, if we gain more ability to act, this is a different basis for discussing uh, autonomy or strategic autonomy of Europeans. So we tend sometimes in Germany to take things literally. So the French president uh, proceeds with political visions and then the Germans tend to begin, what, what did you really mean? Who uh, is going to command whom? Who is going to sit where in command and con control structures? So we tend to, um, I, I would say, a strong institutional thinking. And that's why the gap also can be that we use the same words between France and Germany, but with different meanings. And that's what we have to clarify in an open and frank dialogue. Thank you. I'm, I'm just smiling because when you alluded that we Germans tend to um, take things literally, I'm still reminded or I'm still hearing the warnings of American experts to take Donald Trump seriously, but not literally. So this just rang a bell to me. Um, so perhaps we better do our homework in this regard as well. But thank you, both of you. You already mentioned very important um, aspects. And like Heather put it, uh, um, a new transatlantic deal has to be fit for purpose. It has to deliver to succeed. And so now I'd like to look at a couple of fields of, of, of cooperation and conflict. And the big elephant in the room, and Thomas Silberhorn already mentioned it, is China and America's obvious strategic orientation towards the Indo-Pacific. So my question would first question in this regard would go to Heather as well. So what will the Biden administration approach towards China be? And some people in Europe fear that it might be at the expense of U American engagement in Europe and in the Middle East. So what is the likely approach of the Biden administration towards China? Well, uh, again, you're absolutely right. And what the State Secretary was, was alluding to, there is a, a significant shift in tone from the Biden administration. The substance is really going to remain quite similar. And so this, this thought goes across to to China. This, uh, you know, America's pivot to, to this began long ago to Asia, to the Indo-Pacific region. And you're absolutely right. Uh, the, the American national security community, community sees China as its most significant long-term security and economic challenger. Um, so that's been happening for quite some time. I would say I'm a little bit more optimistic uh, that there is a bit more space for more transatlantic uh, cooperation approach because, and again, this is this is the challenge I think that will be um, for both American and European colleagues. You cannot completely dismiss everything that the Trump administration did simply because you do not like Donald Trump. Uh, there were things that this administration uh, acknowledged the problem, and I would argue, but then tactically did everything not to solve that problem. But you have to acknowledge that, uh, you know, this, this had been a long-term trend of addressing China as a challenge. And we now are very clear on a bipartisan basis uh, that China poses a, a very significant threat. Europe has also moved significantly over the last few years in recognizing uh, China does pose its challenge. And I would say over the last several months between Hong Kong, uh, uh, the, the, the issue of human rights violations of Uyghurs, and even in Taiwan, there is now an understanding that this is not just the trade partner and market access issue that we need. But as Germany shows us every day, this is hard because China represents an incredibly important market, particularly for the German automotive sector. Um, we, you know, wanting to be that bridge, that balance, if you will, to, to keep with Western norms and values, but to keep trading. 
that balancing act, I think, is going to get harder and harder as we proceed. And it's essential for the United States and the European Union to remain incredibly close in conversation on telecommunications technology, infrastructure, state-owned enterprises, subsidies, the IP theft, all of the issues that Europe is well aware of. But it's very hard to, to make those challenges. We can do it together. This is why I'm actually quite excited when the UK takes over the G7 chairmanship next year although it may be a very fraught moment for, for the UK, they're putting forward this democracy 10 concept, which is exactly where I think we need to go in the 21st century, bringing the Indo-Pacific democracies, European democracies, the United States together, start creating alternatives, start working together to move China towards more internationally accepted norms. Uh, but the sec state secretary is absolutely right. Um, where Europe does not play a very strong role is in the security dynamic uh, in the Indo-Pacific um, we've seen where NATO countries have been participating in RIMPAC annual exercises. NATO is talking about this much more and that exactly as the state secretary said, this global awareness, the political conversation. But Europe is going to have to not only manage our neighborhood um, uh, that is becoming more and more fraught by the day, um, but also understand that their security interests and $5 trillion worth of trade lie in the South China Sea. So we are going to have to have a broad broadened uh, conversation. I think we're ripe to do that in the United States. The dynamic will be, though, for the Biden administration. Uh, the Biden administration will never be tough enough on China vis-a-vis um, uh, -vis many in the Republican Party. And that gets into a dynamic that we don't want to see how tough we're being. We want to have policy responses to get China to change its behavior. If that sounds familiar to our conversations on Russia, uh, it's very similar. We have to work and sync together to try to get behavioral changes. And if we don't see those, we stand united in our principles and our values. Thank you. Um, Mr. State Secretary, um, I guess you could underline, you could subscribe to everything Heather Conley just said, but perhaps we could, you know, go a little bit more into detail. As Annegret kamp kahnbauer yesterday said when she proposed a new transatlantic deal, um, she stated that there should be a common transatlantic approach whenever our interests converge. Um, so my question would be, what do we do if they don't converge at certain time points? And we've seen that in the past. And in general, what role do you see for Germany and European NATO allies in the Indo-Pacific? Well, the answer to your first question is quite easy. We should focus on those questions where we converge and we should seek for converging uh, our ideas in relevant matters. And uh, indeed, uh, the role of China and uh, the Indo-Pacific region is at stake in this regard. Uh, that's why we have to do our homework first within NATO, among European NATO member countries, uh, in order to be prepared and free to discuss the global questions. And again, um, it's a challenge, maybe for Germans a bit harder than for others, to gain a global perspective in foreign and security policy. To state it very clearly, I didn't see this so far in our foreign policy from Germany. It was very much focused on the European Union, on NATO, on the United Nations. That's good for sure, but it's not the global perspective we need to address global challenges and global threats. And things are at the table. Uh, we've got years ago in 2015, the sustainable development goals of the United Nations. Yes, there is a global approach in many uh, crucial issues. But uh, again, in security and defense policy, we have to gain this a global perspective as well, and this has consequences in our attitude to China, for example. And this is one core issue we have to, where we have to converge among uh, the, in, within the tra transatlantic community, among uh, European and uh, transatlantic partners. Uh, and I think this, uh, this is possible. Maybe we will get uh, different uh, ways to go, but uh, we should be um, convergent uh, in, in, in our aim, how to deal with China 
and this uh, not only economic and financial but also military rise and uh, so i think this can be an added value for nato to strengthen the political dimension of our community in a way that we mutually benefit from our um, uh, approaches that might be different but clear in a common goal and we should also see that uh, beyond eu and nato there are many liberal democracies around the globe uh, standing at our side when it comes to individual freedom and rule of law and the protection of human rights just to name australia japan south korea singapore yes and this is the the core reason why my minister Kram karrenbauer uh, announced uh, several times already that we will take this closer into our account and uh, the German government uh, just recently presented a new strategy on the Indo-Pacific and we will complement this political strategy by concrete deeds also uh, by the German Bundeswehr by sending a frigate to the Indo-Pacific uh, next year in order to make clear yes uh, there is a partnership beyond NATO beyond European Union in order to uh, tackle with global problems we have to uh, strengthen this community of uh, value partners, including democracies around the globe. Okay, thank you. Um, before I'd like to, to include the audience and their questions, and I see them lining up already, um, I want to go to the second big elephant in the room, which, prim which was the, the primary <laughs> elephant in the room for a long time and have I already alluded to it. Uh, let's talk about Russia and NATO's core um, task of the deterrence and defense. Um, during the election campaign, um, Joe Biden said that he would get tougher on Russia, right? And have I already mentioned that, that we might expect a, a new start extension very soon once Joe Biden takes office. So my question to Heather and then to Thomas Silberhorn would be with regard to the Russia and deterrence and defense initiatives. Can we expect a new strategic approach towards Russia from the Biden administration and to um, the State Secretary, uh, what would we like from a European point of view um, the, um, to happen um, with the new administration with regard to Russia? Heather, you might go first. Uh, thank you so much. Um, well, I, I don't believe that the uh, president-elect is going to be announcing any resets. Uh, I think that era is, is over. Uh, I think there is a quite a lively debate within the U.S. foreign and security policy community exactly on how to how to think about uh, an engagement strategy with Russia. Um, and of course, election interference. Uh, this is where you know the the strategic catastrophe of the 2016 election interference intervention is that what it has created is the Democratic Party, which is always been traditionally the party that is uh, the most open and, and eager for engagement, for discussion, for dialogue, that party um, is, is very upset uh, with Russia for what it, what it did, uh, the lack of, uh, of course, policies from President Trump to hold that accountable to undercut the United States government and intelligence community. So there is an element that there's real anger <laughs> and there may be steps that are demonstrating that anger and that frustration. But I think the other part of the conversation is we have some very big issues that we have got to address. That is clearly arms control and strategic stability. Uh, and, and I think this is where uh, a close allied conversation about the future of the arms control architecture, uh, Europe's role in that, uh, because it's no longer, this gets to the, the, the global perspective that the state secretary was saying, because it's, it's no longer sufficient for the United States and Russia to have an arms control dialogue. It has to bring in other partners that are now developing capabilities uh, that are as threatening, whether that's China, whether we see that as North Korea or Iran. On. So this is the challenge. It's no longer a bilateral conversation and that, that's hard to, to get at. I think the places where, again, transatlantic policy is going to be as essential is policy towards the post-Soviet space. So not only do we have Ukraine, and I think, again, 
Ukraine became such a politically polarizing conversation in, oops, uh, so sorry, <laughs> in, this, um, in this conversation because of the politics in the United States, but you now have Belarus. Um, we have events in Nagorno-Karabakh that uh, need some very uh, intensive conversations about Moldova presidential elections, even Georgia. The post-Soviet space is going to be an area which could lead to greater confrontation with Russia potentially. And I think you're going to see a Biden administration is going to be so much more focused on human rights, on rule of law, on democracy. If we are not in sync with Europe uh, on that policy, it's not going to be uh, a very effective policy. So I think there's going to be an enormous focus on that. And then finally, I would say the, the Biden uh, campaign has been very clear that anti-corruption is going to be a major centerpiece of their foreign and security policy. I think this is how we get at the challenges of uh, Russian malign economic influence as it exists in Europe. I think it's an approach for Chinese economic influence in Europe as well as in the United States. Um, so I think we have some very big issues uh, that from a policy perspective may lead to increased tensions with Russia. But I think these are exactly the issues that we have to have a dialogue with Russia to make sure we don't have uh, any miscalculation uh, signaling that perhaps could lead to conflict, but that we are very clear about what we stand for and what we believe uh, are violations of the rules uh, that we stand for. So this is an incredibly difficult relationship. I think you'll see a little bit of both a little bit more, you know, rigor in, in policy thrust, but also searching for those mechanisms for, for dialogue and understanding. So we need Europe to be part of that conversation. Thank you. State Secretary Sibahon, please. Yes, I can agree to everything what has been said, but indeed there is a lot to discuss among NATO members in our attitude towards Russia. Um, yes, we need dialogue, but uh, also deterrence. And I think there is a chance to be very clear on our side uh, as Europeans and NATO allies. Um, we have some economic issues as well, Nord Stream 2, for example. And uh, this is an interesting issue because it can showcase what dependency really means. Are we dependent from Russian gas as Germans, as Europeans, or is it the opposite that Russia is dependent from uh, German and European customers. Uh, dependency in, in this regard can also be a part of uh, stability on the continent and a part of dialogue. Uh, by the way, Russian exports uh, not more gas and fossil energy to Germany than to the United States. And that's why I think there is a common ground for, for, the, for the discussion. And we should also keep in mind that the European Union um, decided on sanctions towards Russia. The German economy is suffering by far more of these sanctions than by the discussion on uh, energy exports or imports from Russia. But um, dialogue is, will remain difficult because um, Russia has uh, not a partnership approach to its neighboring countries. And I think this is the decisive difference. And that's why we should uh, showcase in the world that NATO is about partnership at eye level among bigger and smaller countries, among stronger and weaker countries. This is uh, the attitude we should uh, apply among NATO, among liberal democracies. And in Russia, we can see that it is perceived as a threat from neighboring countries. Russia does not respect the territorial integrity of neighboring countries. It does not even respect the physical integrity of its own citizens. And that's why my conviction is this is not a forward-looking approach. This won't be enough to contribute to the solution of uh, global challenges. So I think um, Russia will have a lot to do on, the, on, on its own. And uh, we should uh, try to take the opportunity in a dialogue among uh, NATO partners with Russia to set up uh, the pending issues of uh, the INF Treaty, for example, of, of open skies, 
So I think there is a lot of room where we as NATO member countries, including the United States, could rethink, reconsider um, our uh, current position in order to strengthen also uh, the opportunities of dialogue with Russia. Uh, thank you. Uh, since it's a very great, um, great turn towards the question of the audience, as the State Secretary already mentioned, Nord Stream 2, um, there is one question um, from the audience by Alan Benson about Nord Stream 2, and it's directed at, um, at Heather. And the question is, what will the US policy be uh, there next year. So what is the, going to be America's policy towards Nord Stream 2 and Germany and uh, the sanctions in, in, in the next year? So I think, again, this is the area where uh, tone may shift, but substance remains absolutely the same. There is strong bipartisan support uh, that, that st states very clearly that uh, Nord Stream 2 is not in the interest of, of Europe to increase uh, both its energy dependency, but quite frankly, I have to say as an analyst, I don't understand it based on everything I understand about uh, Europe's uh, laser-like focus on climate and climate change and the new Green Deal and Energivendi, that you have a focus on um, a, a positive energy program that's not increasing your carbon footprint and your carbon intake. So I think on many, many grounds, this needs to be rethought the problem is it is so far advanced. Uh, it makes it incredibly difficult. But I, again, I think you're going to see exactly the same response from a Biden administration, not the tweets, not the not that part of it, but the same policy. We have a problem with this. And to be honest with you, it is not simply Nord Stream 2. It is Turk Stream, which is turning into Balkan Stream, which is only growing Europe's dependency on, on Russian gas. So uh, if there's not you know, sufficient national security issues to increase Europe's energy uh, diversification, I would argue it, it, this runs contrary to Europe's very, uh, very ambitious energy and climate policies. So I don't simply understand the policy, to be honest with you, but it will remain the same. Uh, you know, would sanctions be lifted against the companies as the Trump administration puts forward? Again, I think you're going to have to um, understand this administration is going to have an enormous number of issues. They're just not going to get to some of these things. And where there's bipartisan support, they're going to allow them to stand, I would imagine. So not going away, still the same issues. Um, and I think there has to do some additional soul searching, particularly for our German partners, on why exactly that they're, they're, they're continuing to, to do this when their uh, climate policies uh, certainly speak to me to be contradictory. Mr. Silverhorn, since it's a very contentious issue, I want to give you the possibility to respond to it, but you don't have to, uh, but to what just Heather Connolly said. Thank you. I think we won't be able to resolve this discussion this evening, uh, but indeed it's not only an economic question. Yes, uh, it's a huge investment, a multi-billion euro investment of uh, also German companies. But we have to understand uh, the political implications and uh, the security dimension of this project. And uh, in this open way we discuss it this evening, we, uh, I think, can, can proceed in the European Union and in NATO. But um, just a slight remark to our uh, American uh, colleagues, uh, this Nord Stream project shows how strong a footprint of an outcoming administration can be. Okay, thank you. And since Mr. Silverhorn, you alluded to um, European um, cohesion in terms of transatlantic security, uh, I would like to address the next question also to you. And um, Alan Post asks um, to address the challenges, if any, that Brexit poses to transatlantic security. So this is another thing we have on our table within the European Union and on in the transatlantic alliance. So what are the possible transatlantic um, ramifications of Brexit and how do we deal with them? 
Yes, thank you. This is a very important uh, question. When it comes to Brexit, it's first um, up to the Brits to decide what to do. Um, but from a security standpoint, I would always argue uh, the United Kingdom will remain and has to remain, I would say, a strong partner, uh, both of European Union and NATO. It's indispensable. The, the, great, uh, the, the United Kingdom is an indispensable contributor to security and stability uh, in Europe uh, as a permanent five member of the Security Council and uh, with regard to the military capabilities. And I hope and I'm convinced that there is also an ongoing interest from the British side to remain a part of our European defense and security community. Uh, I'm not sure how far the Brits are willing and prepared to go, but um, there is a variety of instruments of the European Union, for example, that could be opened for third party participation. Uh, as we did it right now with uh, the permanent structured uh, cooperation. So my uh, strong hope is and my invitation will always remain uh, to keep the Brits on board, to keep also on the continent our understanding for, for the British situation and for their interests. But indeed there is an overwhelming uh, common interest in contributing together to our common security in Europe. And as NATO ally, of course, uh, the United Kingdom is on board, so this won't uh, change. Uh, in, 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 um, there, so there is a security domain beside the European Union, but if you want to strengthen our European pillar within NATO, uh, I would say, Yes, I, I say it as an invitation. Uh, the Brits uh, will be needed in future again. So we should not uh, take the, the hard questions of the Brexit negotiations uh, too heavy when it comes to our security uh, policy. I am always open for uh, British contributions and for a good collaboration. Okay, thank you. So need for cooperation beyond Brexit, for sure. Um, there's another question, and I think it can be addressed to both of our panelists today, and it's by Aman Kumar. And um, he says, in this conversation, we have presumed that there will be a smooth transfer of power in the US and that there will be clarity in January. So I think this is a question that many people asked in Europe, but also in the United States. So Heather, what is your take on the possibility or the like likelihood of a smooth transition um, until January. And the second part of the question is, how should Europe's and Germany's approach be to any disturbances to the smooth transition? Perhaps, Heather, you might go first. Of course. Well, um, it is very unfortunate uh, that we have not had the type of clarity and, and trans transition processes that are, have been established by law in the United States exactly to make sure they're to avoid, you know, basically turning norms into, you know, legal frameworks. Um, I think we are starting to move towards getting that clarity as the individual states will are, are now in the process uh, over the next several days of certifying that count. That's where it stops. That's where the legal challenges stop. So um, I, I don't, well, oh, I'm so sorry, <laughs> I'm our dog. <laughs> uh, that our, um, uh, you will see the certification process happen. At some point that transition, the teams go into the different departments and they begin that process of transition. That will happen whether the president makes a formal concession or not. But you're right, the polarization is so deep in our country that this is not going to be an easy transition. This is not necessarily going to be as President Obama welcomed 
than President-elect Trump and Mrs. Uh, and, 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 and the first the first lady elect into the White House. That's not going to happen, unfortunately. But that speaks about the individual, not about the system, that there will be a transition of power. Now, the next four months may be extremely bumpy. I think you'll see executive orders and pardons and announcements like we've seen over the last 24 hours uh, that are to make it difficult for the next administration uh, to, you know, distract from getting back on track. Um, and I, I think, again, this is all giving the American people um, an idea of style and substance and what's important and of value to our country. And it's very unfortunate that we are messaging this to, to the world, but I believe we are going to get there. It's been not the, the picture we would want. And I hope for future presidential transitions that we know that this is not the way to act. Okay, thank you. Um, another question from the audience by Roberta Shayu, I hope I pronounced the surname correctly, um, alludes to the idea with that both of you mentioned um, that democracies need to work together and that Joe Biden in his first year of in office wants to have a global summit of democracy. And the question by Roberta is to please address whether Poland and Hungary and Turkey can still be considered useful NATO allies with their policy differences which, with other allies. And I might add also with concerns other allies might have about their democratic policies within their countries. So perhaps Thomas Zibbon might go first and then Heather could um, talk about Joe Biden's approach to towards democracies. Well, first, I don't see Poland and Hungary in line with Turkey. And as members of the European Union, um, Hungary and Poland have to deal with um, our instruments within the European Union, including the European Court of Justice. So my experience is, yes, there are hard words in discussions, but uh, there has always been respect, at least to, pre to proceedings and to decisions of uh, the judicial court. So in this regard, I would say it's up to the European Union to resolve the pending questions and to establish mechanisms that enable us to do so. Um, Turkey is a bit different and indeed the situation in the Eastern Mediterranean is a concern for all of us. Um, growing tensions and unilateral actions um, are not a bilateral issue between Turkey and Greece only. It's uh, in the common interest of NATO partners uh, to keep uh, cohesion and stability within NATO. And that's why we have to offer formats for dialogue, which by the way are used by Turkey and Greece. And we have to urge in particular Turkey uh, to stick to international law and uh, to look for solutions on this common ground of the rule of law. So I, I want to remain optimistic, but of course we see that there are hard discussions in front of us, but um, my expectation is that uh, we can succeed as NATO allies uh, to keep uh, Turkey in this dialogue at eye level. And of course, um, the membership of Turkey in the, in the NATO, in the Western community, um, is a joint uh, geostrategic and geopolitical interest of all of us, and primarily in uh, Turkish interests. And uh, that's why we have to be clear, we have to be open and frank to each other, and we should use the opportunity as NATO alliance to offer the corresponding formats for dialogue. 
Well, I think this is where uh, there will be a, a, certainly a shift in a Biden administration's approach to uh, both uh, the Orban government uh, as well as to, to the Polish government and, and, and to Turkey as well and to President Erdogan. Um, I mean, in some ways, this is a collective failure. So I think we have to acknowledge that um, the, the, you know, particularly I think more grievous in, in Hungary, this has been going on for a decade plus and Europe, unfortunately, is now confronting the consequences of not addressing um, anti-democratic tendencies within its own member. And now it's blackmailing it to prevent it from proceeding uh, with desperately needed recovery funds and the seven year budget. So I, I think that's a failure. And the US, unfortunately, in the last four years has, has it helped to enable it. And unfortunately, previous administrations didn't deal with it successfully either. And I was in the State Department uh, in the first first administration. So I, I take responsibility for that as well towards towards Central Europe. But now we must begin to address it. And as the State Secretary said, look, the hardest thing to address is when your allies uh, begin to turn away from democracy and stable policies. And that's certainly Turkey. I think there's recognition in Ankara, they making some important changes to their government. They understand uh, that there will be a shift in, in approach from the Trump administration, or I will speak, say President Trump's uh, particular outlook to a Biden administration that is going to, you know, prioritize democracy, rule of law, um, civil society. And this is going to be incredibly difficult. Um, this is where NATO, again, in this political dialogue, has to hold a mirror up to itself and making sure that all of its members are meeting the preamble of the Washington Treaty. And right now, I do not believe that all members are meeting the preamble uh, uh, language of the Washington Treaty. So we have uh, an incredible amount of work to do, but we can, again, we need to do it together. It's primarily, obviously, Europe has a huge role to play for this, but the United States has to stand with it shoulder to shoulder. This will, I believe, is the one of the main contributing factors for um, uh, European disunity. Uh, which if it's not resolved is only going to deepen. So uh, this is a huge task and I hope it's part and parcel on top of the transatlantic agenda in a new Biden administration. Okay, thank you. So we've heard about common challenges. We've heard about common internal challenges within the transatlantic alliance. We've heard about external threats or challenges posed by Russia, by China, by autocratic states. So in the end, I think we have a huge agenda for the next years to come and uh, our debate could go on but unfortunately one hour in a digital format is a very very um, tough job to do also as a moderator so in the end it is my turn to thank both Hava Connolly and State Secretary Thomas Silberhorn uh, for taking their time to participate in our road to election night so I really appreciate it and I'm sure the audience appreciates it as well so thank you for taking the time to be part in our joint venture I would also like to thank the audience for their questions and I'm very sorry that we really didn't get through most of them, but um, it is just a very tough, tough job and I'm sure the debate could go on. I just want to, to inform you that you better stay tuned because the road to election night is going to continue till inauguration day in January 21st. So we will have lots of other um, events. The next one is going to be on December 3rd about migration policies in the United States and how they're likely to change under the Biden administration. So please stay tuned. But first and foremost, please be safe in these difficult stay times and stay healthy, everyone. And thanks for tuning in. And once again, very much, uh, I want to thank Thomas Silberhorn and Heather Conley for their great contributions. Thank you very much and take care. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.